Cool. Okay. Um, so, um, yeah, welcome to the um, Imagine Writing session. So, um, I guess we're in kind of an imaginary Truman Brewery setup, and it's really buzzing. Like, feel like Brick Lane's just outside. It's a really good vibe. Um, but obviously, we're kind of all in our flats. But I think this is going to be uh, quite an interesting discussion with a bunch of people who. Um, work in various kind of roles across the design and advertising industries and um, they're all experts in kind of why writing is so important in terms of like brand communication, how a brand interacts with its audience and that writing can be on anything from sort of posters to social media or apps or kind of scripts for films. Um, so it's going to be a nice broad chat today I think. Um, my name is Emily Gosling and I'm an editor at large at Elephant magazine as well as freelance writing about design for places like creative review and ion design so yeah we're going to be talking about um our panel's experiences of judging the the best writing from this year um so on the panel i we're going to start with avril delaney who's a senior copywriter at the dublin-based agency boys and girls um she was judging on the radio and audio jury so that includes things like writing for adverts um, that use radio broadcasts, podcasts, um, and that takes into account not only like the quality of the script writing, but how technology might be used in a creative way and various other factors as well. Um, we've also got Nick Eagleson, who is the co-founder of the brand studio Saboteur, which is based in East London. Um, his, his kind of, I don't know if this is a formal job title, but everyone in the agency seems to have... Um, a kind of adjective and then saboteur. And he's the playful one, so I'm excited to hear a bit more about that. Um, he was previously at Super Union, and um, since 2015, he's been the leader of DNAD's <coughs> Creative Thinking Masterclass. So, yes, yeah, it's going to be nice to hear from him. Then we've got Nathaniel Lawler, who I think is in Portland now. Correct me if I'm wrong. That's correct. Was it he just started yesterday at DDB uh, full time? So, he'll be working on Skittles and Starburst and some other brands there. And then finally, we are going to hear from Francesca Tenenbaum, who is the head of words, which is a good job title, at Here Design, who are also based in East London. Um, and Here works with clients like Somerset House and The Tate, Adidas Originals, and a bunch of really beautiful packaging designs and, and branding for kind of food and beverage stuff. So before that, she was a senior writer at Design Bridge. Um, so yeah, it's a real nice, real nice mixture of people, and I'm very excited to hear about the bits of work that you want to show off and why. Cool, so first off we're going to hear from Nick about um, the piece, well, one of the two pieces he's chosen, which is Channel 4's Complaints Welcome. I'm not homophobic, but do we have to have gay kissing at dinner time? Tell Prue not to talk with her mouth full. So uncouth. He's too posh. Too black. black, black. Too much Botox. She looks like Tom Cruise. It wouldn't be so bad if he tried to make himself look like a normal woman. He looks like a walrus. <laughs> it's boring. <laughs> right, Channel 4 is incompetent on many different levels. What? It's just inappropriate. Alex Brooker's arms make me want to puke. The arms are fine, but the back hair could do with a trim. I mean, this just confirms my suspicion that women aren't funny. <laughs> Shush! Her outfit is totally inappropriate. Whatever. Do you know nothing, Jon Snow? They're not real athletes. No. The man's got sausage fingers. Those gears need subtitles. Hardly. Me? <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, Mo. No one's actually complained about you. Do you want to talk, talk us through kind of why that one stood out to you? Yeah. So, so there's just so many things to love about that. Um, we it, it, we loved it. we all loved it. And it was one of our favourite use of words of anything we saw in the whole of there were 600, how many, Francesca, 630 entries or something, tons. And it was such a great use of words. And think about it, it's not even not even the words of, that's one of the best in-house agencies in the world, actually, um, yeah. but not even their words. 
Uh, and it's sort of tempting to think, well, did she use someone else's words? Sometimes, you know, when I couldn't have put it better myself, you just got to let people dig themselves a hole. And all they did is they used their own words against them in the most wonderful, funny, warm, playful way. So sometimes the very best words you can choose, because people want to find authenticity and freshness, right? They want something that just sticks in your mind and feels real and feels grounded. So use their words. It's such a beautiful way of doing it. Um, and that, that idea that you can turn a negative into a positive, which is what they've done. It's funny and it's colorful and it's great and it's beautifully put together. That's where you elevate what is some really shitty raw material, right? People moaning. How much do you hate people moaning? I hate people moaning and people moan all the time. They've turned that moaning into this glorious um, portrayal of what is everything that is true about Channel 4. And that's where it's great branding is tone of voice and we had lots of discussions about tone of voice it's really hard to do it's really hard to define it's really hard to get other people to buy buy into it and use those words their description on the website is fantastic for this their entry all the entry said was a film of these words it said channel four receives hundreds of complaints every single day they prove everything we stand for that is That's a so, fantastic yeah. entry like I wish I'd written those, you know, we write boards and this and that, they nailed it. So it's just wonderful. And I think the ability to do that is, um, is so brilliant. So that authenticity of freshness um, comes through and it says everything you want to know about Channel 4 as a brand. What a bit of branding that is. I would like, just say like confidence in a brand is so attractive, you know, and uh, a brand that isn't afraid to take the piss of it out of itself. And there's so many times when I work on a brand that is that just takes itself takes itself way too seriously, and it's a real obstacle to doing uh, great work a lot of the time. So I think that's just like a really um, attractive trait in a brand. As a as a watcher of it, you know, I'm just like when I see a brand that's not afraid to uh, to take to not take itself so seriously, I'm, I, I find that really attractive. There's a, there's a craft thing about that Definitely. as well, which is not so much to do with the words or it's a little bit, you sort of, it would be tempting to say, well, I didn't write those words. Moany, horrible, moany, prejudiced people wrote the words and they just used them against them, which is brilliant anyway. But it's brilliantly edited. It's not easy to take the hundreds of complaints they get every day and from it construct a meaningful little story which lasts for whatever, 90 seconds. You know, that is a piece of crafting of editing and tying together from which a lovely story emerges and that's where the brilliance of their own writing is to be able to make it into one thing is also incredibly difficult and is beautifully done and people we were watching that complaints welcome like they'll watch nike i'm a londoner and all this kind of for years and years and saying look at that you know you couldn't improve it yeah oh beautifully put thank you so much um, so we're going to move on now to Francesco, who's going to talk about we compost. Uh, so this this is this is a million and one miles away from complaints welcome for Channel Four. It's an incredibly um, sweet and charming rebrand for get this Auckland's number one compost company. Um, the the reason that it stood out to me um, is I work at a I work in a studio that deals primarily with branding, brand refreshing, um, packaging design, and we have a lot of um, interactions with our clients and with brands and their focus is primarily on the visual. And sometimes we have to open their minds up to say, have you considered a kind of a, an assessment of your voice? Do you have one? Do you want to revisit it? Do you like the way that you sound right now? Do you like your verbal personality? Do you even have one at all? In which case, please let us give you one. And it's amazing the, the difference that a tone of voice can make to a brand refresh or to a brand new branding project, but also how effectively words can enrich design. So this is really a kind of less is more when it comes to copywriting, like big time. Um, but I find that what they've done, heroing the kind of humble worm, having to take a very unglamorous and kind of fundamentally unappealing subject what you put in your compost bin and encouraging people to compost and educating in a way that doesn't preach or doesn't bore or doesn't isolate is that is actually very smart and very sweet so 
I got this beautiful typographic treatment, um, an incredibly simple but effective brand design, but they've just taken little touch points where they could and they've decided to use language and they could have actually chosen not to do anything linguistically. They've chosen to name every shade of green in their kind of um, BVI, kale, spinach, kiwi. They've written guides on how to compost for kids. I just think it's a really harmonious way of bringing something which on the surface is incredibly small, um, and verbal into something much bigger and visual, but just elevating it and enriching it and not letting it become a missed opportunity. So it was actually awarded um, in brand refresh on our jewelry, but I think it's stunning simplicity and it's it's sweet and, and perfectly pitched tone of language just really helped to, to enrich it and make it all the better for it. I feel like it kind of evokes like a um, sort of seventies, like, photocopied kind of like Earth Day flyers or something in a great way too. A little Sesame Street, a little kind of public information, but in the best kind of possible way. I thought it was a tr just a true delight actually to see what they'd done and that they hadn't, um, they hadn't neglected that part of their brief. It made us want to compost as well. That's the thing, all the best work we love. <laughs> We all made us want to like go places or do like do, do composting. You inspiring work is it inspires you to want to like do something, learn something, and it, and it's one of those, isn't it? We got really involved. I have such a soft spot for any work that is done for a brand that you can imagine someone almost like a creative team kind of dismissing. Like I always think about. I mean, it's the most obvious one, I guess, but Old Spice in 2011 or 2012. Who's going to be chomping at the bit to work on Old Spice back then? Who's going to have gone through? university or start their first job and they say what's the brand you really want to write for I don't think back then anyone would have said that in my job I certainly would have ever, ever kind of dreamed of saying I you know I want to give a voice to a worm that's about to eat some compost but I have such a uh, such a respect yeah. and love for brands that make something ignorable or unappealing in interesting and exactly as Nick said I am now interested in compost I think we've got Marmite next haven't we Marmite yeah. mind control I hate Marmite. Yes. You love it? Oh, you, you hate, hate it. it. I hate Marmite. So how do you get haters to change their minds? You change their minds. Hello, Marmite hater. G'day. Hi, it's Marcus from Dudley. Marco. Listen, I'm trying online dating for the first time, but no one's swiping right. Marmite no drama, Marco. All you need junk. is a bit of an image upgrade. Try adding a few props to the old profile pic. You a cute puppy dog. A book of poetry. Or an orphan you saved from a knife-wielding shark. And you might want to delete Marmite. the bit that says you're looking for an open relationship. Really? Yeah, that's a convo you can have on date three. Marmite. Great. Your I'll friend. give it a go. No worries. Fosters. Marmite. Good call. Drinkaware.co.uk for the facts. Um, yeah, and I, I, an idea like writing subliminal messages into other brands' ads is so genius, but it's one of those ideas that you're just scratching your head going, how has no one ever done this before? You know, um, it's brilliant. Uh, and our jury president, Levi, he had this great quote uh, by David Mamet uh, about the best ideas being both surprising and inevitable. And I really think this is a perfect demonstration of this. Um, and what's really remarkable is they got real brands to buy into the idea of their ad being taken over by another brand, which is so bold, not to mention an absolute logistical nightmare. Um, and it, it felt like the idea behind this just like didn't take no for an answer um, and really persevered. And it resulted in, you know, a really brilliant piece of radio writing that feels really brave and entertaining. And the spot was pretty much universally loved by our jury and the jury even felt that, you know, the radio execution of this campaign uh, with the subliminal messaging is you know potentially the best execution and best expression of the Marmite mind control campaign overall, um, and and since you know radio is is often so or can be sometimes seen as the supporting act to the sexy main event of a massive brand film, you know seeing radio work that you know seeing radio that almost works better than the other executions feels really refreshing, um, and a radio spot like this, um, it's kind of you know creativity in its purest form. It's a strong idea expressed through language, expressed through words, and there's nothing else to hide behind, really. I'm, I'm, a, big, I'm a big lover of, of, of radio ads as a medium, generally. I think they, they do, exactly as you said, Avril, they kind of get 
seen as the supporting act or something which isn't as um as desirable to work on or as desirable to kind of spend time honing and craft <clears throat> It's it's like the love hate that so the the Channel Four thing the complaints is like a love hate relationship with their provocative TV and so you just use it you use it and then you grow to love using it and it becomes part of your voice and everything and then other people love it the great the most amazing thing about Marmite is people love and hate Marmite everybody loves Marmite everybody loves a Marmite brand yeah you know, like love Marmite I can't yeah, I can, it's not so food right? it's disgusting but I love the brand and it's part of the magic <laughs> that you really use it full with with all your heart if you like and it's another of them sort of um provocative challenges to the status quo like they stick it to the you know to the sort of status quo brilliantly same as channel four you know they're and they're hard not to admire when I mean, they've got the guts to do it sorry just to your point uh, nick on that like that it's so interesting that you know their positioning is about you know you love it or hate it but almost universally we all love marmite as a brand and as a jury that's something that we kind of really felt we're like oh god like it, it's marmite like you know the the team behind marmite have produced such amazing creative in the past and you want to make sure that you fairly judge it you know so you kind of almost go into it going okay you know you feel like you're going to love it before you hear it. And, and that was almost something that we discussed. We're like, you know, let's really consider, you know, what we're judging here and ensure. But, you know, we just couldn't argue with how good and the kind of the good feeling that we had after we listened to it as the jury. It was just kind of across the board, one of the pieces that wasn't kind of highly debated. It was just across the board, just had this universal appeal that everyone was just on, uh, on, on, the, on the same footing with this. Awesome. Yeah, thank you so much for sharing that one. Um, so we're going to move on to Nathaniel, who's going to talk about the IKEA Silence the Critics work. Mm. Here we go, I think. I must confess, this place ain't blessed. This place is a mess. It's disgusting. But the but, but, no, you don't deserve no guests. No. In here, in here, I don't want to lay down or rest. Are you crazy? That crack in the wall needs addressing. The state of the floor is just depressing. Man. This table's older than the pyramid. It's older? At least it's younger than the mirror is. This place is small and it's barely a house. Never mind the cat. You couldn't even swing a mouse. It's so small. Hmm. Those curtains are looking tired. tired. Decorations are tired. tired. Look, your style is fired. fired. It's like somebody hit you with a bulldozer. But if your house was a car, it would get pulled over. Excuse me, please. This is very, 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 very unacceptable. Silence the critics. IKEA, the wonderful everyday. Fresh and clean. Yeah, so I I, uh, I love this spot. I thought it was just really like, like in the spirit of not overthinking it, um, which then I'll do after this. Um, it's <laughs> just like a joyful, fun spot to watch. And it I feel like it's very much um, in tune with the ikea uh brand personality of just being a joyful fun furniture store and and um it's it's like um it's just really well executed i think um, i could watch this spot again and again i have watched this spot again and again we ended up watching it a lot it rose really easily and swiftly in the in the levels uh in the cat in the in the jury that i was in um it was pretty universally loved and um it's um, just to get into the details a little bit. I think um, it's a smart use. So it, it's first of all music. I've I've done some stuff with music. I really appreciate music in in advertising when it's used well and executed really well. But it, it's it's often done poorly. I think, and it's it's too easy to do music poorly. Uh, sometimes it's just you know whether it's just left in the hands of the the music house or whether it's just um, just kind of uh, shortcuts or whatever. But I think that in this case, the music was was really well executed. Um, I had never heard of, I'll be really honest, I, I hadn't even heard of the category of grime before this, but um, 
you know, it's a Whoa. UK <laughs> thing. It's a UK thing more than a than an American thing. But um, I guess the the rapper is named D Double E. Um, and uh, anyway, it's really good. It's a great use of the the tradition of like a diss track, which you know certainly there have been many playful diss tracks in the hip hop in hip hop history, but it's oftentimes like a diss track takes itself very seriously. Um, and I think this is like a really fun, lighthearted sort of twist on a diss track. Um, and, uh, and just the, the track itself is great. I love the fact that they used the same voice. Obviously it's the, it's the voice of the rapper, but I, I like the, the executional choice of not changing the voice for every single character. Um, and, um, Another thing I want to say about it is that it has a ton of CG in it, obviously, and CG is tricky. In my experience, I have found out the hard way that CG can end up, heavy use of CG can, can really backfire on you when you're trying to be funny. CG can be really unfunny. Um, I almost always will try to go practical over CG in any case that I'm trying to be funny, but it's really well done here and it's not... It doesn't hurt uh, the humor at all. It helps it, if anything. Um, I love the choice of the characters that they, of all the little objects that they turned into characters. I think they're smart, and um, there's a lot of little great uh, humor just in even what those characters are. Um, another thing about it that's sort of just interesting is that this is a Christmas spot, you know, <laughs> and it just doesn't feel like the sort of sappy, um, sentimental, like. Uh, cliche Christmas ad, you know, it doesn't, it, it, it would stand out in that. I didn't see this ad actually, like, um, and, um, but um, obviously in a, in a field of very like, in a, in a field of a lot of like warm, sentimental sort of uh, emotional Christmassy ads, this would really stand out, obviously. I love, um, like, just to echo that, I, it, in the UK especially, uh, we love a Christmas ad. Like it's a thing here, maybe unlike it is in any other country. And we've had like so many, t you know, we've had boys with boxes for John Lewis. We've had young boys with pianos also for John Lewis. We've just had every John Lewis ad for the last seven years. And I think this is so genuinely fresh and unusual. Um, it's, it's fantastic and, and exactly as you're saying, Nathaniel, it doesn't tug at your heartstrings. It's not trying to be sentimental. It's almost if you take the tree out, it's nothing about it is overtly that Christmassy, but it's so closely aligned to how you feel at Christmas. You know, people coming around to your house. What's the state of the place? What are they going to think of what I've got? What are they going to think of what I've done with my space? But the language that I really liked about it is they just use, I mean, obviously the brilliance of DWE, but they kind of subvert things like, you know, they say this place ain't blessed, this place is a mess. But that just makes me think, you know, there's awful pictures that you say bless this mess. They've just pulled out so many cute linguistic things that you yeah. on, on kind of chintzy prints and, and embroidered into cushions. And they've just seamlessly molded it with with the flow of grime. And I just think it is immaculate. And it's one of my favorite adverts of all time. Yeah, I was just going to say um, that, like from a writing perspective, like it's super mind blowing and it and you can kind of imagine that like the copywriter and the creative team that worked on it would have had so much fun working on you know writing those lyrics and crafting them and you know it just that kind of really you know uh, is so clear when you watch it like it just is so filled with like such uh, kind of fun and interesting uh, turns of phrases as you pointed out uh, Francesca it's it's, it's amazing it's deadly. Cabrones, it's Juan Gomez on WMB, The Sound of the Road. Today we received at the studio a very strange letter with the tape inside. Check it out, amigos. The sky over the river was cloudy. It was going to rain. Let's go home. We can't really carry any more anyways. We had been away from the castle for over three hours. 
We were all hungry and tired. Maybe we hadn't gone where we were supposed to go, but we were coming back with better stuff than the others were expecting. The others is where we like to talk about the adults. It's not as if we are not a group. They're just so protective that most of the time we feel like they're just looking down on us. Whatever. The grocery bags were stuffed full of dandelion greens, and we even found a ton of cattails. I guess none of us had ever thought of eating cattails before. One of the women at the castle, Louisa, had taught us what to look for. She took the brown part of the cattails that looked like a hot dog and ground it up into flour. Cattail pancakes were on the menu at the castle now. And to be honest, they were okay. Why don't we cut through the White House? Maybe because the place is full of armed men? Come on, it's just JTF, guys. There's nothing to be afraid of. It'll be faster. Well, it's still men with guns. Not all men are bad. You know that, right? True. Only men with guns. And what about the guys from the division, hmm? Our dad is from the division, and he's a good man. We are not going through the White House. End of discussion. And why do we still call it the White House? It's not even white anymore. All of the kids lost their parents, and all of them made up stories about their parents to make themselves feel better. Ivan and Amelia never stopped talking about their dad, a division agent fighting at NYC. We all knew their dad was dead, but no one wanted to be the one to tell them. It was kind of a pact between us to not break each other's illusions. They were our security blanket, the ones that helped us fall asleep at night and the ones that gave us faith to wake up in the morning. Even I had a security blanket, but it was not my parents. In the first couple of days after things started to get bad, my mom was already sick then. And my dad had caught the dollar bug soon after. Both of them were dead a week after Black Friday. The people running the quarantine site kept me there for another two weeks. This is how I met the other kids, the other orphans. I know, it's weird, but I feel like I have to use this word because it was true and I had to face the truth. My parents were dead. I had seen them die. When we judged this, uh, we ha we didn't have access to the case study. We literally just um, listened to the, cause it's, uh, I think, six episodes in total um, of this kind of uh, fictional podcast series. So it was sort of, we were able to judge um, the, the writing uh, in, in a really kind of pure form. We, it was literally just the long form storytelling. Um, and as, as you can kind of see fr from what we just watched there, you know, this was a, a podcast in, this was a podcast uh, to promote one game hidden inside the world of another game. Uh, and it was found um, via the in-car radio uh, that gamers listen to while driving within the game. Um, and what was kind of really interesting about it was that using the radio within the game meant that, you know, they could be reached without the spell of the world created being broken. Uh, and it just allowed for ultimate immersion. Um, and, you know, there's a richness to these stories. Um, you can't get that from just the case study alone, but you know, it's not just an audio book with one narrator. There were different voices for each character. You know, the sound design, the production added richness and texture to the writing. And um, the sound design was almost used like a, a kind of an audio illustration to accompany the dialogue. And it all supported the writing in evoking this entirely kind of new world. Um, and I read somewhere that uh, the six episodes was, um, I think 40 pages of script in total. So this is almost like writing like a feature length film script. Um, and this sort of uh, long form storytelling, like it requires real commitment from to the creative by the agency. Um, and from a writing perspective, the jury just felt that, you know, it really moved the industry forward. And, you know, and from a personal perspective, you know, it made me excited about the other uh, long form writing opportunities. Um, that, like they essentially invented a whole new media channel um, and a new way to connect with the viewer um, and just a really kind of powerful use of storytelling in, in its kind of truest form. Wicked. Thank you, Abro. Um, so we're going to go on now to Nathaniel is going to talk about uh, Sandy Hook Promise Back to School Essentials. This year, my mom got me the perfect bag for back to school. 
These colorful binders help me stay organized. These headphones are just what I need for studying. These new sneakers are just what I need for the new year. This jacket is a real must-have. My parents got me the skateboard I wanted. It's pretty cool. These scissors really come in handy in art class. These colored pencils, too. These new socks, they can be a real lifesaver. I finally got my own phone to stay in touch with my mom. Blimey. Well, that gave me actual goose pimples, that one. Yeah, so, I mean... Every time I watch this, I feel sick, you know? I feel like my heart aches. It's like, it's really impactful, which is exactly what it's meant to be. Um, I mean, just from like, it's it's interesting because for me, I would talk about this sort of in two levels. One is like the execution of it as like an ad. Um, it's just really well done. Um, the details are there, the casting's good, it's shot well, and it's certainly, uh, it's nailing the uh, the tropes and the cliches of of the genre that it's sort of uh, subverting, you know, which is just like bad, like you know, J.C. Penney, uh, Ross Dress for Less. I don't know if any of you guys know what any of those stores are, but these like cheap, uh, you know, uh, stores that you know um, advertise to like parents for like back to school specials and stuff. Um, it's nailing that and the stock music and everything about that is like done right. And then it sort of subverts that genre into something um, really um, impactful and um, really important. Um, so like from an executional standpoint, I think it's great. I don't have any, this was my favorite um, spot that I saw this year. Um, and, um, you know, I just uh, like as we were going through the spots in the jury, I just would think to myself, like, OK, if I was CDing this, like what what would I what, what would my like next like round of email comments be to like, hey, we need to tweak this or tweak that. And there's just really nothing I can find in this that I would change. You know, I think it's just perfectly executed. Um, um, and, um, you know, and then just from from a sort of um, on an emotional level, like, um, you know, it's it's really effective. Um, and um, obviously the the how well it's executed, like plays directly into how well how effective it is emotionally, like those two things are, are tied together. You, you, you wouldn't have the second one without the first one. But just from an emotional standpoint, like, it's such a um, you know, it's such a heavy and important and like sobering topic, uh, especially, you know, I mean, primarily in America, right? Like gun violence and especially gun violence in schools. Um, so I think the way that it, like I said, that it sort of takes you um, uh, down this um, road, you think you're going down one road and, and sort of uses the, the most sort of cliched kind of, um, just sort of saccharine, corny, like genre to then lead you into sort of the polar opposite of that into the most sort of important, you know, heavy, sobering, just crushing, like realization, I think is particularly powerful. Um, and um, kind of points out for me, what it does is it sort of, it sticks right in my face, how we have in this country have sort of turned what should be like, the top most important um, topic in the country, arguably, like children getting killed. It, and we've almost like turned it into a sort of a, a cliche in our culture, you know? And, and this sort of makes me, reminds me of that in a really painful and, and um, effective way. So I love it. Yeah. And I, think, I think it's a really important spot. It's incredible. I, that's the first time I'd seen it and it was, um, Exactly as you say, the, the 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 masterful subversion of the kind of twee, trite, goody goody, back to school, price led kind of thing. Like these are going to make my life better. These are going to help me make my friends. And that twist that you realise, you know, as a viewer, I'm like, oh, I'm in a really safe, familiar, 
predictable place. I know what they're going to tell me. I know where this is going. And then that kind of plunge from being safe and familiar and not, oh, the kids are mucking around. The kids aren't doing what they're meant to be doing in school. <laughs> He's breaking your window with his escape. Oh my God, no, the kids aren't doing what they're meant to be doing in school. This is everything that their school should not be. It is so powerful. Um, I, that was that was a real punch in the gut to watch that. And I'm so pleased you picked it to, to share with us. It, it, what a phenomenally powerful piece of communication. I was just going to say, just it's just... You know, it's it's interesting that there's a lot of ways this could have been executed, and I think they chose all the right ways. And it's like it, you could you could look if you just look at the dialogue, it's it still is a, a corny back to school ad. You know, they didn't ch the execution of the dialogue, the delivery of the dialogue becomes more sort of um, emotional to the point where the last line is delivered through tears, but. The, the the dialogue itself stays sort of true to the the kind of corny uh, you know back to school ad. And the other thing about it is if you watch, if you go back and watch every single shot, it's like the perfect escalation of details in the background. In the first shot, the kid just looks, and you, that could be anything. And in the second shot, I think um, you see someone uh, kind of come into the classroom and hurriedly shut the door. In the third shot you see some kids kind of scrambling in the deep background and then, in the, you know, and it kind of escalates from there. So it's like, it's, it's just orientating. a- it, it, Not that it could ever mimic what, what that must feel like to experience, but that kind of, actually, I don't know what's going on. I don't know where I am. I don't know what I'm listening to. This is, I recognize elements of it, but this isn't how it should be. It's, you know, it's, it spins you around um, as, 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 a, as a, as a viewer of this, um, it feels it feels reductive to even call it an advert, but as as a viewer of this piece of work, bit bit like the Marmite yeah. mind control. It it makes me think when you see those things, um, it's power emotionally powerful. Who 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 needs to see that for it to change? Because it's a it's a film which is intended to change something and not just choose one thing over another. But who needs to see that? And do you think that people whose minds need to be changed or given pause for thought see that where do they see that it's a hard question but so powerful but is it that's a good point that's a good point i mean and I, I meant to mention that too is that it sometimes a great so I, i'm certainly guilty of making uh, an ad that i think is good but maybe doesn't if i'm being really honest doesn't truly like speak to the people that i'm trying to speak to but i think this perfectly does because you're trying really to speak to the parents to get them to sort of to motivate action, you know, um, and this is the, the 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 ad that this is sort of um, you know subverting would be an ad that would be speaking to those same parents, you know. Yeah. So I feel like it really does that well in this case. Um, so Francesca, yeah, you you made some really lovely points about that ad also, and we are moving on to you now um, to talk about Holly Davidson, please. So you're on this thing, right? And it's just you and the road and the wind and the trees. And it fills you up. Wait a minute. I think I should back up just a little and explain. That thing I was talking about is a Harley Davidson. You know, the iconic American motorcycle company. Yeah, that Harley Davidson. Well, lately they haven't been doing so hot. The riders are getting older, sales have taken a hit. They're up against new challenges. Sally riding just isn't as popular as it once was. So we went to the core of what people feel about Harley Davidson. We found out that we were kind of the original wellness brand. <laughs> no, no, not like that. A full throttle wellness brand. Sounds crazy, right? But science backed us up. Studies show that people's minds were most at peace when riding. And riders we talked to agreed. Your world just melts away when riding. You're flying, but centered. Lost, but found. Every part of your body is engaged. Every part of your mind is activated. Synapses firing, dopamine oozing. It's chemical. You get off and you feel reborn. We took this idea and applied it to everything Harley touches. We removed the clutter, found the essence of the barn shield, and created a new simplified logo. Our photography captured the mental, emotional, and even spiritual effects of writing. Because sometimes, well, clarity comes from seeing things in a blur. 
Next, we made a film that showed us that in a digital world that's always on. Keep scrolling. Check followers. Don't go outside. Don't leave the phone behind. Don't think. Don't ever let yourself feel this alive. It's the off that people are craving. Breathe. Ride. From the bottom up, everything was about full throttle well-being. Because at the end of the day, the magic isn't about what the bike can do. It's about what the bike can do to you. Yeah, I wanted to I wanted to talk about this. I think it, it's really hard to follow what we've just spoken about with something like this. It seems so trivial and trivial in comparison, but um follow I will. Um what I like about this is it Harley Davidson is such an, an iconic American brand. It's it and it's I think of it as being really serious. You know, it's been around for over a hundred you know, for over a hundred years. They have this really famous uh, manifesto which has done the rounds for for quite some time, and they describe themselves as being, um, you know, Genghis Khan on an iron horse, and you know, saying that they're for the riders, they're for the road. This really kind of like testosterone fueled, um, powerful piece of writing which has guided a lot of stuff that they've done fairly recently. And what I love about this is that it's, they've taken two things which seem completely incongruous. They've taken wellness, they've taken a hog, um, and they've brought it together with this idea of full throttle wellness. And I, I think what I really liked about it is their kind of use of taking something which is a genuinely interesting and unusual insight that, you know, freedom of the open road is actually a cure for um, freedom from modern overwhelm and technological overload. And they've, you know, they've turned something which is, really high power and really high speed into something which is actually incredibly calming and relaxing. And the thing, you know, the insight is great. And I think their kind of approach to create work that doesn't isolate existing fans of Harley Davidson, but that can also entice and intrigue new riders potentially, which is the whole point of this refresh is, is really great. But the headlines really stood out for me, um, which were kind of whizzed through in the case study there, but the kind of idea that they could write things that are the embodiment of this incongruity, you know, headlines that say that's the sound of raging tranquility or clarity comes from seeing things in a blur. I just thought it was a really smart expression and execution of a really solid idea and to turn something that's so, you know, thundering and and petrol soaked and, and, and revving and revved up into something which is kind of so spiritual that it actually becomes soothing um, was a really smart way to use language um, and, and enjoyable to engage with and I think has the power to change the minds of people who perceived Harley in, in, in the way that I used to do. Um, I've never considered it to be a, a brand linked to wellness, but to label it as full throttle wellness, um, I thought was a masterstroke and I think Droga did a, did a really great job with tackling such a, a, an iconic piece of Americana with this. We all loved it on the jury, didn't we? And it was because because you have to judge it based on the idea, the execution, and it's sort of fitness to for purpose in the real world, like it's going to change something or do something. And it's just such a good idea. It's such a good idea because you think if you've got to reboot Harley Davidson, all those associations, like a hundred years of associations, you can't try and remind people of what was great about Harley Davidson. You know, you, there's no chance you can do it. And they just took another path, and you just think, God. There's a whole other journey that they could have gone on and now can go on. You think, yeah, that's as true as the old one. That's not easy to do. And to celebrate those things through through awards like this, to say, no, go looking for that road less travelled. You know, go looking for the other answer, which is as true as the one that you would expect. And it gives people the courage to think, no, there is a better way to do it. And we just, I just thought it was fabulous. Um, and like like the other like the other um, things that we we loved, I speak for myself, was it made me think, oh, you know, quite fancy that feeling. I'm not going to go and get a motorbike, but you know, just give you a little tingle, and that's like, wow, you watch that case study, and you think, you know, bet that feels good. That's the first step in a long journey to me getting a Harley Davidson. So finally, Nick, we are going to hear from you about the Woolwich Contemporary Print Fair. So a bit like with the radio thing, that you want the somehow the best words, it's almost like yourself talking. Somehow the words are in your head and you they, they feel so real for you. And this is a lovely little thing. We didn't have lots and lots to choose from, uh, which were great expressions of writing just about the writing. But this was a piece of branding as opposed to a piece of advertising, a piece of branding, which really relied on its words in order to 
um, tell you who it was and what its personality was. I think buying art is like buying wine and is buying other things. There's this whole world being built up, but like you don't know. You don't know enough about it, you know. You don't know about art. You don't know what's right. You don't know what to choose. And it's wonderful, a contemporary print fair where the missing bits of where you might have a picture know kind of what's in your head. You want to buy it because it's 40 by 60. You know, there's little bits of truth in there which are totally charming and they break down all the sort of pompous barriers about, well, about taste and all those sorts of things. And they let you just sort of approach buying a piece of art just from your own level. And it's all the way through it. And the words are what makes it. It's very, very understated and simple. And it's totally charming. And I love the sort of humble, even the back of the lack of a film, right? The humble honesty of it, which just gets you loving, because people want the work in their houses. People want to live around art, but they don't really know where to start choosing. And it taps into our, our doubts and fears in our heads about what we like and what we don't like in a really beautiful way with just a few words. And it runs through just everything. As a little smile, a little smile in the mind all the way through. No, I just thought it was really interesting that, you know, something, it's advertising something so visual and chooses to let the words do the talking entirely, which is just, it's such a, yeah, an interesting um, move for them to make and it works really well. Yeah, it's really, really clever. Mm. So we've gone through, I think, all of the bits of work that you want to show. So thanks ever so much for sharing those. Like, it's been super interesting and such a real breadth of uh, breadth of stuff there. Um, so yeah, I guess first of all, I wanted to pick out a couple of specific things that had come up from the work that, that we've been shown just now. Um, the first one was um, yeah, starting right right from the very beginning with the um, Channel Four kind of approach of using a negative as a positive and spinning that around and, and turning it back on itself. Um, I don't know if, if, if perhaps I've just been missing things, but it does feel to me like there are more brands who are kind of taking that approach of spinning a very negative thing. Like I guess one, one that springs to mind is like KFC when they run out of chicken. Um, but yeah, how far do you guys feel like it's kind of um, a fairly recent thing that brands have been doing that? And I guess when does it work and then when might that approach not not work i think it's part of brand's bigger quest to have a purpose and to feel like they're doing good um i think we we saw a lot of work on the branding jury which was um brands hoping to um change perception or to put something good back into the world so i think it, it's spinning something negative into something positive is a brand way of saying we see the world like this, we see that there's a problem, we want to do something to help. And I think sometimes it works incredibly successfully, sometimes it, it rings hollow, but I think it's all rooted from a place of kind of brands looking for a higher meaning and, and to say that they stand for something and to be on the kind of the, the right side of things. I think that's, that's mm. quite a large part of it. I do think it goes back to since the very, you know, the earliest days of companies promoting themselves is you can labour under the burden of all these negatives and if you can tackle them head on it goes back like avis we're number two so we try harder right back to them and it just tackled it head on and it's charming and it lasted for years and years and years and it's one of those sort of principles of a lot of great ideas where you just take the thing channel four gets so many complaints it must be bad telly no it's not it's great telly it's great telly so they just like and i think it's an age-old thing but it's a great one so i i think brands should be doing more of it because there's so much negative and it's getting turned into sort of like heartful. You could take negative, turn it into something joyful. You have to add creativity to turn all this negativity around us at the moment into something which is amazing and creative and funny and all of those things. You know, it doesn't all have to be, there's all this bad stuff, but we really, we're feeling it. And of course we feel it and everything, but we can, as an industry, can make it beautiful again or funny or charming, yeah. all of these things. Yeah, I mean, it shows confidence, right, to just, like, not be afraid of, because it's like brands are so brittle, you know, they're so, like, oftentimes, they're so afraid of, like, any sort of possible, like, negative complaint or any, you know, it's like you hear these legends when I, I, I would hear legends when I started in advertising about, like, a you know, one like letter someone sent in and like an entire like campaign gets yanked mm -hmm. off the air because they're so worried about offending anybody or anything. And I think for brands to have that kind of confidence is just really attractive, like back to what we were saying yeah. earlier. 
Yeah, it's clever sure. too because it listens, right? So, so that they listen to the complaints. So it does two things. So it uses the complaints against the people who are like moany, prejudiced people, but also it shows that they they read them. You know, they're mm -hmm. part of what they think about, and it's clever in that way that it's says, well, you know, what you think about it. We listen to those things. We disagree and we agree in some of them, but it's that as well, you know. And that's great brands, and it they sort of feels an authenticity which comes through it, um, which is is a prize, a real prize for brands. Yeah. Cool. I mean, yeah. I, so I guess aside, from kind of again speaking to all of you, like um, looking at those sort of trends. Obviously, there's a few things that we've already picked out that um, a few of those spots have shared, and like you just said, the BBC one aligned quite closely with the Channel Four one. I mean, were there, broadly speaking, any other kind of main trends or themes that that you could pinpoint from what you saw this year? Um. What, what I found, what myself and, and the uh, the other uh, radio and audio um, jurors found kind of interesting, um, which is kind of one of the reasons why I wanted to show uh, Marmite Mind Control, um, because um, th they were campaigning at 30 second spots, but in the individual under, 30 seconds or under uh, radio category for the past two years, um, no spots have been shortlisted, let alone awarded. Um, and it's kind of funny because the 30 second slot is sort of known as being the most commonly found radio length on brief. So it's kind of, you know, it begs the question, you know, as we've sort of started turning our attention towards innovation, uh, especially in, in audio formats, you know, have we kind of turned our back on uh, seeing the potential in traditional radio ad formats? Um, but, you know, that's why, you know, I think that mind control is great because it really proved that you know as we discussed already there's still a way to be innovative within mm. a, a traditional um, radio ad spot it was just an interesting thing that we noticed whether it's a sign of the times or you know I'm, I'm not sure but um it's interesting i still think for young creatives especially though there's a massive opportunity um to you know like uh, for us from the perspective of a copywriter and um, you know it's the ultimate kind of leveling ground you know um you it's it's all about the the sort of the 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 um the how good the idea is you know there's nothing else to hide behind you can't hide behind a big production company you're you're it's literally you know based around how good the writing is how good the dialogue is how good the idea is uh, and how well that's executed so um it's there's such an opportunity there uh mm -hmm. to really do something interesting <clears throat> from a creative standpoint i think Francesca, I don't know whether you agree. I think from our perspective, there was we we there weren't that many great examples of where words and writing were used to create a really strong brand, either a refresh or a new brand. You know, it was there were there was it was much, much more use of design to do that, much more use of visual elements to do it. And there weren't that many which were defined by their voice, which is why tone of voice is such a hard category, but it's to be <laughs> Um, encouraged and everything because that because when you get into the industry you realize how powerful words are not just powerful words in execution powerful words in explaining your ideas to other people you've got to have words to tell other people in your team or in your company your clients what your idea is and it, it's they're incredibly powerful and they're a tool which are not perhaps used as uh, you know celebrated as much as they could be or they should be and so it was hard it was harder to sort of say well that one's defined by its words and what you thought Francesca we didn't find lots uh, I, I think it's a combination of things. I, I think there, this being the first year that writing for design and writing for advertising weren't their own categories meant that in a what would be my kind of traditional sphere, which would have been historically judging writing for design, um, we had naming and we had tone of voice, but then writing for packaging went into the packaging design category and everything was kind of disparate. So I think there's possibly some confusion from brands about what to enter and where, so like a, a logistical element. Um, I think there is better work out there than we saw reflected in our branding jury. There are things that I was almost kind of, from other agencies, not, not you know, not, not people I know, places around the world, which I thought, oh, I'm, I'm sure, you know, they enter things for DNAD, we'll see elements of this work cropping up, certainly here and certainly there, and, and just not seeing them. So I think it's... Um, I didn't see as much good writing as I would have liked to have seen. Uh, and I don't think that's because there is a lack of good writing out there. I think there are maybe 
wider issues with how to enter it and where to enter it and and writing maybe not feeling like a solid a category uh, as it used to um and i think as well maybe people thinking thinking about things in in an overtly visual way people thinking oh well, we've done this and we've done this so we'll enter it into brand refresh and we'll enter it into design for this and we'll enter it into motion graphics for this and there are some things which i did see and i think actually that could have being considered for its writing oh that did have a really smart turn of phrase oh that did have a really nice tone of voice so I think it's um a missed opportunity actually if I'm honest this year I, I really I, I really, that's, yeah I know there's been quite a lot of discussion around um yeah that decision that was made to uh incorporate writing into the design and advertising categories um but like, do you, do you feel it's kind of done the opposite in a way? And I guess, yeah, what would, what, what would be ideal for you as a judge and as a writer um, as the best way for people to, or yeah, I guess as the best way to see writing represented? Yeah, like the theory is good, but and it's really uh, just to, to Francesca's point. It's 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 also the first year, so you know there may be some teething problems. So it's very hard to judge yet, um, and I suppose we have to be prepared that if it doesn't work, maybe reverting. Um, you know, ultimately it shouldn't matter what category is subcategory is in, as long as you know the quality of the writing is being judged for the right reasons. Um, but yeah, it, it's interesting that you know Francesca is mentioning that you know even her jury observed like oh, you know, perhaps they should have gone into this category and maybe it would have, you know, done better or whatever. Because a good story from our jury room was that there was a piece of radio entered into the over 30 second category. It's called, um, uh, I want to give it a shout out because it was brilliant. It's called Further Fetched by, um, it's from a South African fast food chain called K Chicken Licken. And I implore you to, to go have a listen to it uh, when you get the chance. Uh, but the writing and the wordplay was so brilliant that we felt like to award it properly, we had to move it into the writing category, which sort of proves, you know, that writing is still very important, a very important conversation within the jury room. And it's something that's really carefully considered. Yeah, yeah. So I suppose there was in, in terms of specifically, you know, what we were looking for, what, so, that, so there was lots of writing uh, and, and as you say, Francesca, probably not some of the things I would have thought would be in there, but I think that's true of every year. You know, you, you, you get what's entered, you know, you don't get the world's branding, you get what's entered. And um, was, was specifically tone of voice, which is, which is more of a discipline, if you like. So that's a sort of a harder one. And there was not that much in there. And I think it's just an education thing or it's an awareness thing of well, what is tone of voice and what do I enter and what constitutes a good. But you're, you're right, Avril, you need moments of inspiration to say, you want tone of voice? Look at that tone of voice in branding, you know, in our discipline, you know, give people some beacons of like, you want to do the best work of your life? And, you, and it's through tone of voice, this stuff is amazing. And it wasn't that, but it, that does come up, but it doesn't come up very often. So sure. maybe, you know, and it's, I know it's like with clients are the same, they don't always quite understand what's great and then how they use those things in practice. And I think that's sure. on us maybe to help define that better, promote it better, get people thinking this is amazing uh, work in this space. Um, I guess in light of that, it would be good to hear from all of you any sort of advice that you give to people who might want to enter some work in future, whether that's a brand or an agency, if you could give them any advice, I guess, around, around, I guess, what it takes to produce award-winning work, whether that's things like client relationships or how they collaborate or, or the thinking behind those. And then I suppose, yeah, any like more kind of tactical things about how people might want to enter the awards in the future. I mean... This is probably really obvious. This was my first time uh, judging, though, and I, I just I was really struck by how um, how much the jury uh, scrutinized every little detail, you know. And I'm a detail person myself, so like, uh, but I, even even listening to that, listening to the jury with you know, as, as we rose up in the ranks and got you know started really scrutinizing every piece of work more and more i was really struck by like how every small detail matters you know that's one thing um which is just an executional thing right it's like um not to let anything slide you know and and the other thing was just about and this is obviously you know this this is probably pretty obvious too but like originality you know i mean um people were um you know uh, much more critical of work that was sort of felt familiar things we had seen. I think it was just like, um, 
you know, just to, just to, 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 to continue. To, it's, it's, it gets harder and harder every year, it feels like, but just to continue to find, it's, it's so important to continue to find new ways to tell, like, there's only so many ideas we can, we can, you know, so, so many stories we can tell, but there's always some sort of new twist on how to get there. And I think that's, that was really important um, for the ju for the jury that I was in. But it's a very boring, practical bit of advice. Um, but I would say, uh, basically relating to to my points of view on on the work that we saw in the branding category, um, with, and and wanting to see more and to hear more from writers. And if writing is going to remain blended um, as part of other categories and not revert to being its kind of own. Um, its own contained category. I'd really encourage writers out there, whether you work in advertising, whether you work in branding, whether you work predominantly with design, whether you work predominantly doing scripts, whatever it is, look really closely at all of the different categories that now exist, because there are there may be way more opportunities for you to get your work in front of people and for a chance to win a pencil than you realise. Mm. Um, you know, look at uh, things like um, brand expression in print. Look at book design look at you know writing for um for film and for television look at writing for packaging design look at writing for graphic design have a have a really considered look at what is out there next year and how the different kind of um juries have been um divvied up because there there may you may not think that there is a place for your writing and you may not think that there's anything at dnad that fits in for you but rigorously look at what there is um, and don't be afraid to enter because you know as some of us on this jury have said that there weren't huge amounts of entries for writing. Um, and if it is going to remain a separate thing, judges will want to see more and they'll happily want to critique and award and, and celebrate writing for, for the incredible thing that it is. So when next year's DNAD festival comes around and it's, sorry, not the festival, when the awards come around next year, look at all the opportunities that are there um, and don't be dissuaded by the fact that it may not have its own category next year. Try and, try and strategically pick out what fits what you do um, and, and, and enter in abundance. Um, judges want to see your writing. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah, I think that's a really great point, Francesca. Um, yeah, it felt like in our category as well, um, the entries for writing for radio and audio were quite light. And I, I don't know whether that's because, you know, I suppose radio and audio as a whole is seen as kind of a writer's category, you know, and perhaps, so, you know, and, and taking that example that I already spoke about there, that, you know, we felt like it was worth awarding in the in the writing category, yet it hadn't been entered into it. And so if you've got a really good piece of radio, you know, making sure it does get entered in, into that category. And then also kind of going back to my earlier point, um, there's a massive opportunity in that kind of 30 seconds and under category um, for more work and a higher standard of work to be entered into. Um, and also just to echo kind of what Nathaniel was saying as well about originality, that was such a kind of a pattern within our jury room too. You know, as soon as something, you know, w was you know, um, reminiscent of another piece of work, you almost immediately discount it, you know? Um, so that's obvious, uh, that's so, so crucial. So, Nick, did you? Yeah, it's, it's a simple one and it's about simplicity. I think with, with words, with anything, it's true, but all the things we liked, which, you know, which we liked for the, for the way they talked, had a clear single-minded voice, whether it's the IKEA critics, whether it's complaints, whether it's worms, whether it's these cheesy school folder ads, you know, find a voice, make it a surprising voice and an original voice, find it and stick to it. The stuff we didn't like so much, the voice got muddied with other voices. And so it was more of a cacophony, that really clear voice and it knows how it talks. Those things were great. And the purer that single-minded voice, the more we like them usually. Um, and that takes, in a way, it sounds easy, but doing simple stuff is so hard because there's all the things you can't say. Um, I have, I'd like to, if it's all right, I'd like to add one more bit to my, practi to my practical bit of advice. No, it's great, it's great. Which is another practical bit of advice. Um, if you are a senior writer, head of words, head of copy, creative director who's a writer, 
please ask D&AD to be a judge next year because we need more writing to be entered, but we need more writers to be judges. So if you have thought that you're maybe not quite right, I thought that I wouldn't be quite right, but it turned out that I was. Um, get in touch and be really proactive and and, um, and play a bigger part in, in the role of judging because um, conversations I've had with people behind the scenes at D&AD have said that they felt that there weren't enough um, writers as judges and, and I'm inclined to agree. So if you are a writer... Um, it's such a rewarding experience. You will meet great people. It will enrich your world and it will really open your opinions. I had a phenomenal time. We had a great jury. We had a really, really good jury president. Um, if you are a writer, do it and give it a go next year. You will not um, regret spending your time this way. It's, it's invaluable. And it helps us and it helps our craft and, and, and it helps give writing um, a bigger platform as well. Oh, that's, yeah, that's such a nice thing, I guess, to, to kind of round off on because it's been it's been so lovely, like, I guess, seeing and hearing all the energy that you, you guys have and all the, like, passion that you have in and the conviction in what's made the work that you've shown really good. Um, and, you know, I guess, like, the, the, the ads sort of speak for themselves, but the way that you've articulated that, and I guess, um, yeah, you all, you've obviously really enjoyed, like, the actual <laughs> process of, of kind of looking at all of these, and I suppose... Um, yeah, picking out what like exactly why something's good, which isn't always an easy thing to do, I think. Um, um, no, thank you so much to everyone that's been on the panel. Everyone's been yeah, so so insightful, um, yeah, so smart in in how they've approached explaining what's made work good and what's not made work good. Um, and yeah, I suppose what all the work that we we've talked about has shown is, I guess it's you know it's all well and good when a brand kind of plays with your emotions, but when it does that in in a new way or a way that really genuinely stops you in your tracks and, and kind of reverses back on itself, then that's really, really smart. And, you know, whether it's kind of like a, a Marmite mind control campaign or, you know, something extremely emotive like the Sandy Hook work, um, all of these things have shown that writing is such a powerful tool when you're creating a brand's voice and that a brand's voice isn't just in the words. It's kind of in the in the confluence of, of its context and the actual imagery that we're shown. So... It really reinforces, I guess, the, the power of words and, and what they can do for brands.